All right. Hey guys, Sean Taggy here, partner and chief operating officer of Memphis Investment Properties. Super excited to be talking to all of you today. Thanks for joining in and listening and just really supporting our company uh, by watching these videos and of course, purchasing properties from us and everything else. We really appreciate all the comments and everything that's been going on uh, so far during our SOFA Summit. So let me dive into my presentation here. And uh, let me go here. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is some market data and then also talking about leadership and communication. So a lot of people ask, so I just figured out how to answer everyone here in kind of, you know, what are the thoughts? Where's the market at? I know a lot of other people are looking at this, but I've just compiled some other data from, from lots of other different websites and everything like that. Just kind of show where we're at. So here are mortgage rates. So comparatively to, you know, since the 1970s, we're still not, not very high, right? We're still relatively low. It is rising a bit, um, you know, and sharply, but we're, we're still pretty low interest rates. Okay. So, you know, I mean, that's just something to factor in and just look at your cash flow. but uh, yeah, that's where we're at on that. This one um, I really like this shows, this is by Redfin and it shows the number of active homes for sale. So during, I'd say 2019 was kind of when it was normal, 17, 18, 19. And as you can see, we had about over a million and a half houses active for sale on a national level. And then COVID happened and we dropped down to 500,000 about. So now we're still under 1 million. So I think, you know, supply and demand, right? When supply is less than demand, right? Market's still going to go up. So, I mean, there's still there's still a very low supply historically, not a lot still being built um, compared to the demand that's out there. So something to watch on and you can go and look at this monthly as and, and watch and make your own speculations and assessments from the data. This is new construction uh, yet again from the Census Bureau. So we're still pulling permits, right? There's still houses being built, but I still don't think comparatively enough to what, what the demand is, is wanting, uh, the growth uh, of this nation and everything like that. Uh, this one I like to just show that, yes, the reason why the 2007 market crash happened is because there were really bad credit scores and people didn't qualify. Since then, they've really changed the, you know, the qualifications for people to get a loan. And so this shows that that a lot of better credit scores for people. So as you can see, most of the credit scores are in the 760 plus um, all the way since really, really 19, it started picking up a bunch. So people have good credit scores when they're getting these loans. This one I like a lot, um, showing the demand. Uh, we have the one of the largest generations coming into play right here, which is the millennial generation. So the blue males and females, as you can see, it's, it's bigger, it's bigger than the baby boomers, right? It goes out to here uh, where the baby boomers is here. So there's there's lots of people, 25, 30, which is about when you're going to get a house. So a lot of people wanting to enter the market to buy a new house, they're first time homeowners. So like I'm saying, there's a huge demand, very low supply, lots, very little inventory on the market right now comparatively. So that's where I think the market is. Am I saying it, it won't go down? Maybe not. I'm thinking it more kind of flatten out, maybe go down a little bit or a little bit up. I wouldn't think drastically up or down either way on market appreciation is my personal opinion. So there's my thoughts on the market data. Hopefully that gives you an idea of where things are at. And these, these graphs, you can make your own assumptions and generalizations from there. Now I'd like to go on to my second part of my talk, which I always like to talk about kind of just, you know, something for you to take home and, and use and apply in your active life. So a new era of leadership. Um, and what I think is kind of happening, a new wave from what I've seen in books and thought leaders and you know, business consultants and other entrepreneurs is that what I see the most powerful and, and the best leaders are, are doing, the most influential, is actually they, they focus less on the power that they have and more on empowerment of other people. I think this is test and tribe throughout all of history, but it's just like a new, new era that's, that's occurring. Um, it's showing that people use persuasion over like the forcefulness of the power that they have and the authority. So it's about um, curiously finding the best solution, not just what you think is best. 
and asking questions and seeking first to understand and then to be understood. That one's from Stephen Covey, Seven High Habits of Highly Effective People. And to lead by influence rather than by the authority that you hold. And it's more focused on less micromanagement and more facilitation. So you're supposed to lead, manage, and hold people accountable. Uh, this one, this is a debate that I love. I've talked with a few people, and uh, it's kind of showing the difference between influence and authority. So can you have authority and influence? Uh, I kind of like to you know, point out like the president of the United States, um, whoever that may be. He definitely has authority, right? The president has a lot of authority. Um, you know, a religious leader, a school principal, a teacher, um, a, a boss, a manager, a business owner, right? A, a man, anything like that. They have authority and they, they can have influence, but authority doesn't necessarily guarantee influence. And let me, let me, and also influence doesn't necessarily mean have a prerequisite that you need authority. So the next question, can you have influence without authority or an authoritative title? And the answer to that is definitely, you definitely can have influence without authority. I would dare say that some people can have less authority than others and have way more influence than them. And you kind of see that in organizations or, or other groups that are coming up. Uh, people can can challenge the status quo of an authoritative figure and have more influence than that authoritative figure has. Okay. Even though Gandhi and Martin Luther King had authority, they were their church leaders or in, or in the government, but before they had influence really before that. So I think authority can really um, magnify the influence you already have. But I think the best thing to focus on is your influence. So the last question here, can you have authority without influence? And you absolutely can. Like you can kind of rank any president and they all have the same authority, but they all have different varying degrees of influence, right? Some some presidents influenced the country way more than others did and others didn't really leave a mark or a dent too much on, on the country. Um, so what this is showing is that I don't think you need to really seek out the authority, like really you should just seek out the influence that you can have on other people. And so I'll be going over how how to have that better. So how can we increase our influence as leaders and as individuals, mainly as an individual? All right, so I'm going to go through an example here of someone. They had authority, but they they mainly led by influence. So Turret Cathy, he was the owner of Chick-fil-A, an amazing, amazing guy. Um, I actually have his book here, Covert Cows. It's not his. It was written by his chief marketing officer, but it talks a lot about him, how Chick-fil-A got started. And... So I'm going to put my camera down here. So he, in the book, he said that he relied a lot on personal power oh, uh, over position power. Um, so let me go on a story here. So this story is from this Covert Cows, page 16. And it is on from Jimmy. So Jimmy Collins, Chick-fil-A's first chief operating officer, said this about Turret. And it's a story. On our grand opening day of Paramos Mall, as usual, Turret was at the lease line uh, offering samples of Chick-fil-A to shoppers. As he returned to the kitchen to get a fresh plate of samples, he said to me, that girl is not smiling. He pointed to Martha. And the, the person he's talking to is Jimmy Collins. Um, so it looks like she's having a bad day. She's not smiling. So Jimmy Collins went to Martha and told her she was to smile at customers, right? Being a manager, right? Using his position power. You need to be smiling, right? <laughs> like telling that to employee. And um, and then he walked away. That's all he said to her. So when Turret returned for another plate of samples, he said, she's still not smiling. And I said, I will see that she does it this time. OK, but instead, instead, Turret stopped me and said, I'll take care of it. I was puzzled. What did he intend to do that he thought would do better than the instructions I was giving her? I watched Turret walked up to Martha and said, why is it that every time I look at you, you're smiling? Um, she did give him a little smile, but it did not last. I thought that was not going to work, but I kept my eye out on her and turret. The next time he passed her as he went into the kitchen, he said, there you are smiling again. Um, she gave him a bigger smile that lasted a little longer, but this time I was giving my full attention to watching the two of him. Turret would often turn from sampling to smile at Martha. Every time he did, she would smile. Soon Martha was wearing a big, beautiful smile that lasted the rest of the day. 
That day I learned a great lesson of how the use of personal power is so much more effective than position power. I learned from a master, Turret Kathy. Turret never told her what to do. He clearly and simple made it attractive for her to do what he expected. As I thought about it, I realized that that was how Turret led all of us. So I really like that. It's like, he's not telling her, he's just, he's making her happy, right? He's, he's yeah, influencing her to, to be happier. And so Turret was like the main owner of the whole company. He had a board, an executive board and a board of directors. But over the, over the years, uh, what his, his leadership team told him and, and the chief marketing officer who wrote this book, he said, Turret would actually rarely use like his authority, like, hey, this is what we're going to do. I'm the major owner. I say what we do. This is how it goes. He only used that less than a handful of times over all these years of, of when he's been running the business. Uh, he says here on page 143, Turret um, was suggesting that instead that we finance growth and simultaneously limiting, limiting debt using only our cash flow. And he made it clear that this would be one of those few times I can count all of them on one hand that he would use his majority vote as one as one as owner of the company. Uh, there was no need for a show of hands. So most of the time when he made decisions, he would listen to everyone's opinion and it would be a consensus vote and he'd lead by persuasion. Um, he would just try to, to stay his point, but he would listen. And so people would listen to him back and they kind of led a peer group accountability team. And so that that's really how you can go about influencing. I, I really like that example from this book. So now uh, the real key to all this is learning how to have good uh, conversations. Okay, so this is from Craig Weber, conversationalcapacity.com, if you want to look him up in Google. Uh, but this is what I've learned from him on this aspect. So I'm going to ask a few questions here. Have you ever been to a meeting and or had a conversation with your spouse or a friend, but mainly work-wise or, or anything like that. And you guys were talking and it was great. You were both feeling listened to. There was a lot, a good vibe going around. You felt respected. There was everyone was sharing their opinion and things were going well. Well, that's called the sweet spot. Okay. This is in the Japanese flag. Um, this is called the sweet spot. So the sweet spot is where everyone's listening. Everyone's engaged in the meeting, in the conversation, and it's going well. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how about this? Have you ever been in a meeting where people are arguing, right? So, so you might go away from the sweet spot to the, to the right over here. And that side is people usually go away from the sweet spot in one of two ways. They either try to get comfortable or they try to be right. So on the right side, and this, this mainly shows up in leaders um, sometimes or sometimes not, but these people are running to win. They, they don't care what other people's opinions are. They're just like, I need my opinion to be right. They're going to argue. They're going to get defensive. They're going to be like dictators, like my way or the highway. I'm the one who gets to pay the big bucks. You have to do what I need to, what I say, right? They're going to micromanage. They might attack. And really, really it's deep down with their ego, right? They're, they're scared to be wrong. And even sometimes they even will be wrong, but they'll still defend it. And, and won't be willing to just be like, well, maybe there's another idea. Maybe just my idea is one, but maybe there's a better piece to it. Okay, which those questions were getting you back into the sweet spot. Okay, so that takes you away. So that's that's kind of the win side of it. Another part that takes you away from the sweet spot of a good conversation is the other way. So the people that freeze up. So they want to minimize the situation. Like, oh, it's, it's not that bad. Like, you know, this happened. They want to avoid. So maybe someone's on the right all arguing, pounds his fist on the table, and the other person just will just freeze. They're not going to talk anymore. They're not going to state their opinion. They're, they're called the yes men. They're just like, yep, I agree with that opinion, Mr. Mr. Boss, Mr. Leader, right? They shut down. And it can even get so bad where they're just apathetic. Well, you know, whatever I say during this meeting is not going to matter. My opinion just gets breezed over, and we're just going to do what this dictator on the right says, right? And, and can lead to apathy and resentment. So and that that who's been in that type of meeting, right? That type of thing that's been happening or seen that with groups uh, on social media or anything, right? That that leads to the, to the wrong way, away from the sweet spot of where we can find learning and have great knowledge. So the whole point of the sweet spot is this, this is where we get smarter, right? We're smarter when we hear mixed opinions and voices and thoughts and everyone's sharing it, uh, regardless of what other people will think, right? They're being brave and, and sharing that. So in order to get to the sweet spot, we need to foster a safe place to talk 
And in order to do that, whether you're the type of person that tries to win or you're the type of person that freezes up, to get into the sweet spot from either side, you either need to be have curiosity, so as a leader or someone who wants to fight, or you need to be candor, you need to speak your truth and be brave. So what does that look like? Okay, so if you're the type of A-type, you know, dominant personality, person always trying to win, or you see yourself that way, and, and also people can be on either side, you can switch back and forth, but generally people tend to be one way or the other, either freeze or, or try to win. Okay, so if you're the person that ten, definitely tends to try to overwhelm and get argumentative, here's what you can do. Um, you can be curious. So curiosity is a strong, genuine desire to know or learn something, meaning to know and learn something from someone else in that meeting or learn that what, what the best solution is. So what you need to do is like when you state your opinions, don't just be like, hey, I we need to do this. This is how it's going to be state hey, I'm considering, make it like a hypothesis, I'm considering if we did this, it, it might lead to a better solution. Or I'm really curious about this. I'm wondering, what else am I missing here? I think if we do this, it'll happen. But can you tell me, so-and-so, what's going on? What am I not seeing here? Uh, what do you think? And then also, of course, when someone does give input to, to encourage other people in your meetings to, to say stuff, always tell them, thank you for your input. Good point. You know, th thanks for letting me know that. I didn't consider that before. If you start doing that, people are going to start speaking up. Instead of you just being the one yelling and talking and saying how things need to go, you actually start to hear different opinions. And also, uh, you, need to, you need to ask people, what do you think? Hey, um, so-and-so in this meeting, uh, what do you think? You haven't said anything in a while. I'm curious to know what are your thoughts about this? So you need to, you know, solicit others to, to want to talk. And then listen without judgment, even if you blatantly believe it's not right or something, it, just let it be. It's, it's just another opinion. It doesn't mean you were wrong, even if it's different than what you said. It doesn't mean it's an attack on you. It's just something there. Um, you need to understand, un be, understand before you can be understood. Okay. And that'll lead to other people wanting to ask you and, and learn. Okay. Now, if you're on the scared side, right? Kind of the person that's fearful of speaking up what they're going to say, you're kind of scared of your boss, you're scared of what other people think of your opinion, then you need to have more candor. So candor is the quality of being open and honest in expression uh, with frankness. It also is about being vulnerable. And that's the ability to sit in the discomfort of the possibility of rejection, right? Like, and that's okay. It's okay if you bring up an idea and it doesn't work. It's not what everyone thinks. That's okay. At least it gives up a point and at least you've spoken what you want. Because if you don't ever speak what you think is right, at least saying it, that creates resentment and apathy. And then you get disengaged and it, you know, it makes you really sad and not like that. So candor, um, to be have more candor in a meeting uh, and you're that person that freezes up and is just quiet the whole time. Uh, state your position. Wow. Like actually say like, and say it clearly. So they call it in the military bluff. So the bottom line up front. So state, Hey, regarding this matter, X, Y, Z, I think we should do A, B, C, D, and E. I think we should do this. I think it is a good idea. I think it is a bad idea. Right? So state that. And don't just stop there. Just don't just say, Oh, I think that uh, might not work out. Then when you say you're that, show your work. You know, you're you're thinking why you don't think that'll work. You think why it will. So typically just give three bullet points, right? My, you know, like my 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 hypothesis or my bottom line up front is this. And the reason why is I don't think that'll work because we've tried this in the past and this and that happened. Um, I think this way would be a little bit better if we did it that way. And here's the data that shows that um, in this report, it shows that we lost money trying that out or whatever. So that's how you can have more candor is your bottom line up front and three bullet points. Okay. So hopefully this shows you a conversational capacity. We're trying to get in the middle. We're trying to, you know, this helps each side balance out and get open and honest and actually talking instead of it just a unbalanced, um, you know, bloodbath or battle of a conversation. And so this guy that has talked about this, um, he, he teaches this to senators, Republicans and Democrats at the same time. And this teaches them how to get on a stage and how to really discuss hard matters when the stakes are high, right? When it, when it really matters, this, this is when you need to have that, that sweet spot, get in the middle 
and start talking about good things and actually get somewhere. Because instead, it, either way it goes, you're not getting anywhere with the conversation. So I'd like to share an example of someone um, who is like this a lot. So another book that I've read and, and really like, another role model, uh, of course, with Turret, and now is uh, Bill Marriott. So Marriott Hotels, you know, I love both those organizations, Chick-fil-A and Marriott. We all know they're, they're great and amazing. And so it's just showing this, this era of leadership. They, they definitely both had this. So National Ge Geographic Society, Gilbert M. Grosvenor, uh, said about Bill, he was on the board, that unlike so many CEOs, Bill just doesn't give have a big ego. Um, so he's got an unusual style based on management by persuasion, not power. Sound familiar? In 1945, Dwight D. Eisenhower asked Bill, what do you think? Um, he, he was just a young boy, and, and Eisenhower like asked him for his opinion. He felt so empowered. Bill felt empowered from that statement, and he used this all the time in his leadership meetings. He would see someone not speaking up, but they have an idea, or maybe someone kind of shakes their head or nods and go, hey, what do you think? Tell me, tell me your, tell me your words, you know, what you're thinking about this. And it just encouraged those meetings to be smarter. Instead of him just talking and leading, he would wait and, and listen to what other people had to say first. Because, you know, he, he, he's not the boots on the ground. He can't be everywhere and anywhere at once and know everything. Bill stated, I became a great believer in that phrase. I've used it, it ever since. What do you think? It works wonders. Um, this more active version of listening is particularly important for skill for high level leaders who by their lofty positions often intimidate junior staff, right? The people are just yes men to the boss. Um, this helps bring them out. Um, he also had another phrase that he loved saying is just no big shots, meaning like, you know, like just be humble. Um, you're no better than anyone else. So I really like that a lot. Um, this is also from, here's the link to it. And this is all over, all over the place. Um, it's just to high performing teams. Okay. So it's kind of an X, X, Y graph here on the bottom here, motivation and accountability, right? We want our, our people, our employees, our, our kids, our, you know, our, our communities, our spouses, we want people to be highly motivated and accountable, right? We want things to get done. We want them to, you know, do what they need to do. Um, but then also like in order to have that though, we don't want them to be burnt out, right? So we want them also to, be, to feel safe, right? Have a good uh, mental aspect of it. So we want that to be high. So let's kind of go through each one of these quadrants. So <clears throat> if we have, uh, you know, just a little bit of accountability and motivation, but you know, it's, it's a really safe place. People are just in their comfort zone. So we're not really, we're not really achieving really high great things, but it is rolling along. Like people are feeling okay. They like where they work. You know, but, you know, we're not really challenging people. We're not challenging the status quo. Okay. On the other side, we can have high motivation accountability. So people are working, right? But it's not really safe. It's not safe to state your opinion. It's not safe to, you know, even, even question anything or like maybe try something different or new. So people are just going to be anxious. They're going to, they're going to shrivel up, right? They'll probably go to the side of the be, be quiet and, and not be candor. And they're going to just be anxious the whole time. Um, if there's low motivation and low psychological safety, people are just not going to care. They're like, well, pff, doesn't matter. No one follows up with me enemies. They don't care if I do my job. And also they don't listen to me anyways about it. So apathy, and that's the worst where you'd want someone to be, uh, the learning zone, the highest place is where we're being challenged, right? So we're not, we're not backing out on like, Hey, you know, you, you, you missed this, right? This, this didn't happen. Why did that happen? Right. But it's, it's asking, why did that happen and how can I help you, right? So it's it's a safe place. Like you're not, you're not going to be chastised if, if you messed up, kind of like, like here. It's not, you know, we expect a lot and then you're going to get, you know, whipped if, if you don't achieve what we expect you to or get fired. Like this is like a safe zone, but also we're accountable. We're wanting people to work and they have it high expectations. And this is where you have the highest learning zone. So you can mess up. It's okay to mess up. You're not going to get criticized or anything for that. But you will be you will be asked you will be accountable for what you have, so that that shows that as well. Um, so all of these thoughts stem from several books and individuals of all similar content. Uh, feel free to reach out and and ask me. But here's some of the books. You know, any book written by Brene Brown on vulnerability, Crucial Conversations is another book. Fifteen Commitments of Conscious Leadership, great book on all this, and the Five Dysfunctions of a Team.
Um, so I really like Brene Brown in her world renowned TEDx talk. I definitely suggest you go watch that. This teacher, this stems on this a bit as well is vulnerability is the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness. But it appears that it's also the birthplace of joy, creativity, of belonging and love. So wouldn't it be great if all of us felt right in that learning zone, that, that the belonging, the love, like when we're really achieving something great, we feel like we're belonging somewhere. We're moving the bar here in our, in our company or in our communities or in the world or whatever it may be, or in our family. Um, it comes there, but you really can't have that if you're not vulnerable and true and open with what you're doing. So it's kind of like a catch 22. Vul you're scared of being vulnerable because of shame and fear is what causes that. But when you let go of that and you unhide it and you show your truth and your, your true cards and you're being candor in what you're talking about, it creates all that joy. It creates great things from it. Um, you know, so I really like that a lot. So in summary, try to get to the sweet spot in your conversations, have candor or curiosity, figure out where you're at if you go to the right or the left here, and then figure out the ways to get back inside. Uh, so thanks so much, guys, for listening and your support of us uh, for this uh, third annual SOFA Summit. Sean Taggy, Chief Operating Officer and Partner of Memphis Investment Properties. Reach out to us if you need anything. And thanks so much for watching. We appreciate everything. Have a good one.